Hi, this is Brother Richard, and today we're continuing with our lesson series, Prototokus Mystery, this will be part 379. We're continuing with our lesson title, Message of the Saints. This will be part 2. We're talking about the theme of the Gospel that will be preached and taught at the beginning of Sorrows. Scripture teaches, at the beginning of sorrows, the gospel will be proclaimed. Turn to Mark 13, verse 10. And the, and the gospel must first be published among all nations. Why? Why do you have a judgment to be followed up by a proclamation of the gospel? What kind of a gospel is it? Turn to Matthew, fourth chapter. Verse 17. Tells you the type of gospel. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In the original Greek, it's the kingdom of the heavens. So, initially what's being said here, for the first time, since the last time it was preached, has given you the significance of the gospel. It has to do with the proclamation of the kingdom of the heavens. Now the whole world, the whole human race is going to hear, and the non-human races are going to hear this, and their attention is going to be brought to bear on the reality of things beyond the earth. When it was first preached 2,000 years ago, why was it preached in that respect? The intention was to get the human race to understand that there would come a time in which the kingdom of the heavens would dominate the earth and this was their opportunity to have a place in it. Since the time that it was preached to the time that you're hearing it now, its total focus is shifted. Because the emphasis today is on getting saved. People's minds are on the earth. And they stay on the earth. And they never understand how to qualify to get off the earth. The reason that you're going to have this at the time you're going to have it, beginning of sorrows, is that those that come out of the human race have to be given an understanding of a reality beyond the earth. Otherwise, there's nothing to lead them in a direction beyond the earth. The whole focus, then as it is now, is going to be earth-centered. Particularly the prototokis. So you have this emphasis on the gospel good news, which is what the word gospel means, of the reality of the heaven, so they can prepare themselves to receive the instruction that they must have to progress toward qualification for entrance into the kingdom. Now, this brings us to the next principle. Scripture indicates the gospel 
that will then be proclaimed and taught will be the same gospel that Paul taught. Paul's gospel. Galatians, the first chapter, verse 11 to 12. The gospel that basically was rejected by even the apostles. Paul talks about this <coughs> in no uncertain terms. Galatians, the first chapter, verses 11 and 12. But I certify you, brethren, the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. So you see the first thing that Paul talks about. What does he mean? The gospel that was preached of me is not after man. Now the word after comes from a Greek term which is pronounced kata. There's many, many, it means basically downward. But it also means according to. He's saying the gospel that's preached of me, unlike the gospel that you've been hearing, is not according to men. In other words, it's not human-centered. And he goes on to talk about this. <clears throat> it's not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, in other words, by man but by the revelation, revelation, revelation of Jesus Christ. The gospel that Paul taught cannot be comprehended from a human perspective. And he's giving an understanding, he's distinguishing the gospel, he's not making a differentiation, but he's distinguishing the characteristic of the gospel. The gospel that the apostles were preached, preaching de definitely had a distinct human, earth-centered quality because it was fashioned in the perspective crucible of Jewish culture. It emphasized the Jewishness of the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. The gospel that Paul preached is totally, radically different. The emphasis not the gospel itself, but the emphasis is not human-centered, Jewish-centered, man-centered. It has to do with the comprehension of a God-centered perspective. Trans trans transitioning beyond man's culture, understanding, and um, a basic uh, desire. Men desire an earth-centered comprehension because they feel comfortable on the earth or of the earth. But the gospel, the whole aspect of the gospel is that man is no longer what he was before, an earth any creature. He's to separate from that and go on to the greatness of what is being prepared for him. In that respect, for 2,000 years, that's, this principle has not been emphasized. Gospel of salvation, get saved. Uh, have your life made better. But make it work for you here on earth. Yes. Did the other apostles believe Paul that he was taught by Jesus in the desert? No. No, they never accept him as an apostle until the last part of it. See, that's the, the thing. They're they walked with Paul. Jesus, okay? Yeah. So they got their gospel from Jesus, and then they, they couldn't ditch their, their Jewish traditional mm -hmm. things. Yes. And then along comes Paul, and he gets it, but he gets it in, in the desert with no one else but him and Jesus. And, mm -hmm. you know, Mr. Jones, but he, he had the, the qualifications above the apostles of being a Pharisee, studying scripture. So he knew scripture, but when Jesus came in and gave him the true 
the truth, the, the meat, the, the, the reality, I could see them having a problem with him because he died. What are you talking about? How could you walk with him? He died. Not only that, but Paul had persecuted the church. <clears throat> he had blasphemed, he had denigrated everything, and now he comes and saying, I'm, I'm a representative now, and I'm going to give you the gospel. That's, that's a, a trick. tough thing, man. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it was difficult for them to accept him as authentic. But Paul basically was showing, he said, uh, I'm going to give you my credentials. Here's a gospel given to me of the Lord. I'm presenting it to you. Don't. In other words, it's tested by the scriptures you already have. But they wouldn't go that direction. They refused. All they wanted to do was to see him as possibly being a convert now to Christianity, not a, a, an equal along their line. And because of it, they made every promise. Okay, now, Mr. Jones, they did see Jesus when he resurrected. Yeah. So now, he is alive, but he has no no, no doings right after, after his resurrection, no doings with... Uh, Forty days he spent with them talking about the kingdom. Then he sends back to heaven. So in their respect, their minds, uh, the, the, the office of apostle ended with the, the eleven. Because now you have the foundation teaching, the apostles doctrine, the church is founded, let's go on from there. What Paul understood is that God cannot be put in a box. And God is explaining things, giving that, that awful word, revelation. <laughs> to give you an understanding that what God is doing is not confined to this little granule of dust called the planet Earth, but God has plans for man to transcend planetary existence. Mm -hmm. The apostles never got that comprehension. They, they never go, went to expand beyond the confines of the Jewish comprehension of the scripture. So the 40-day teaching <coughs> would have prepared them for what Paul was being. It would have if they listened if they, to exactly. him. Exactly. <coughs> if they paid attention, I should say. But he gave them instructions of preaching the gospel. He said, go to every nation. Right. They never did that. He told them, everything I've taught you, you taught them. They never did that. That sounds pretty familiar. Yes. It's, it's human nature. You want to confine things to what you feel comfortable with. That sounds like members of the church <coughs> saying, I've, I've, I've got enough. I yeah. don't need any more. Exactly. Yeah. And he grabs Peter. <clears throat> gives him a supernatural vision. Peter, you're on the roof. Kill, eat. No, Lord, I've never taken anything that's impure. Don't call what God made impure. Three times he tells him this. It took him three times just to let Peter, just to let a Gentile come in under his door. Oh, I'm going to call what God created impure. But he couldn't go beyond that to see that in the scriptures what was there. So the Lord takes Paul to here. This is a chosen vessel. He's going to take it to the Gentiles. So the, my brothers beyond the Jewish fold. <clears throat> but let's go on. Scripture indicates unlike the linear presentation of today's gospel the faithful and wise teachers of that time will present their brethren with their eternal relationship with the Father, just as Paul did. In other words, Paul presented his gospel unlike the way the apostles were presenting their gospel. They would go forth, they would teach things dealing with Jesus being the <clears throat> Messiah, Jesus being in the Scripture, Jesus being God, all from a Jewish perspective. That's why it was so difficult for Jews to go beyond what they knew from that perspective. The Judaizers, these were Christians. They were converted. They couldn't get away from, they couldn't get off the earth because of their comprehension of the Gospel from a Jewish perspective. Matter of fact, turn to um, Acts, first chapter.
<coughs> Acts, the first chapter, verse 6 to 7. You can see how ingrained the human aspect of the gospel was to them. <clears throat> now Jesus is being with them. He's going to be with them for 40 days, teaching them about the kingdom. When they therefore will come together, they ask of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. They're looking for the promises that pertain to Israel. They saw only saw the gospel from a Jewish perspective. So, having heard his instruction for 40 days, that's what they're coming out with. Yep. They didn't listen at all, did they? No. Not a word? No. No. Because 10 years later, they weren't preaching to, to the Gentiles. It took a supernatural move of God to get one apostle to go to a Gentile and speak the God. Right, right. But well, I was focusing on... The heavens, which is what Jesus oh, is saying, it's the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom. Heaven, not and even the earth. Saying, <laughs> not no, even no, the no. earth. Jerusalem. Yeah. Not even the earth. Yeah. And the only way that, that um, Cornelius heard the gospel was because he was uh, received by the Jews of that community. Right. So you see how hard it was mm -hmm. for them to break the culture, let alone get off the earth and sure. comprehend the things sure. of heaven. Sure. Wasn't happening. Anyway, <clears throat> Paul, totally different. Paul first starts from a God-centered perspective. Ephesians, first chapter. <coughs> when you get there, we want verse 3 to 5. The scripture indicates, unlike the linear presentation of today's gospel, the faithful and wise teachers of that time will present their brethren with their eternal relationship with the Father, just as Paul did. Ephesians 1, verses 3 to 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. That's where Paul starts off. The apostles are radically different. They're going to take you to the Old Testament. They're going to show you Jesus in the Scriptures. They're going to confine everything to a Jewish, earth-centered perspective. Paul starts off with a <coughs> plurality of existence, a God-centered knowledge. These are baby Christians. They're just He just heard about them being saved. And he starts right off the bat with giving them their eternality. Right. And he goes on. Paul's Gospel stressed the importance of Christ's sonship and de-emphasized and de-emphasized the importance of the Jewish identity. Galatians 3.28 There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. The apostles would never, would never go into that direction. Because it takes them off the human perspective. Paul consistently emphasizes this. Turn to Galatians 6.15.
For in Christ Jesus, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. In other words, you must be a new creation. That's the only thing that matters to the Lord. Whether you're a Jew, whether you are a Pharisee, whether you have come through all the rituals, means nothing. What means everything is if you are born again. That's how Paul starts off the Gospel. That's how the faithful servants are going to present the Gospel to their brethren. Scripture teaches the faithful teachers will instill in their brethren the pursuit of their eternal identity and inheritance emphasizing the spirit of wisdom in Revelation. Revelation 5th chapter, verse 9. And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. <clears throat> redeemed us to God so they differentiate themselves from the human race. They're declaring in their testimony, we come out of the human race. We are no longer part of the human race. We have been redeemed, totally separated from the human. We've been prepared for life in the heavens. Why? Because of what they've been taught. They were taught by Jesus or by Paul? By you. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Ephesians 1, 17. <clears throat> Remember, this is the initial instruction that Paul is giving to baby Christians that he just heard. He isn't even there. He's writing to them. Because he knows their prototokis. He's gone beyond the fluff of earth-centered Judaizing, stressing revelation to what needs to be given. Verse 17 that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, talking about the Father, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. This should be instruction that every Christian gets today. But nobody that I've seen has a comprehension of, what, of what's being said. What's most important for you to do when you get saved is to progress toward praying that the Father will give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Why? Verse 15, the eyes of your understanding be enlightened that you may know, that you may know. The word know there, perceive, discern, comprehend. What is the hope of his calling? In other words, what you've been called to do, what you've been called to be, and what is the riches of his glory, of his inheritance in the saints? The heavens. Your destiny has nothing to do with the earth. That's verse 18, Brother Jones. He said 15. Sorry. Well, I'll I just stand make corrected. sure everybody else... Uh, okay, I stand corrected. Yeah, <laughs> verse 18. So he's giving them the understanding of what every born-again saint should be pursuing. Not this vague, nebulous, get saved and do some nebulous good works that you're on your own to find out what it is, and uh, there you'll be. He emphasizes consistently the heavens. 
Scripture indicates they will be instructed to totally, totally focus on their destiny in the heavens. Colossians 3, verse 2 to 3. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you're dead, and your life is hid with Christ and God. The other apostles would never give them this injunction. Would never tell them, focus on the things of heaven. Why? Because to the Jewish mind, the promises lie on the earth. The promises of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are all passed now from generation to generation to generation. The inheritance on the land the things of earth their mind cannot go to Colossians uh, 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 level teaching only Paul the closest you come to that is go to 1st Peter 1st chapter what he does touch on Verse 3 to 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you. It's as close as they come to touching on the inheritance of the saints. Paul goes into great detail 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, stressing what it is that connects your inheritance to you now. Celestial body. Yes. Charles, I'm getting the, the sensation, and I, I hope I'm wrong assuming what I'm hearing. Mr. Jones, it sounds like the apostles aren't qualifying for the inheritance. They are. They are, well, they all died martyrs' deaths. They were faithful, but they chose to limit their capacity to ascend in the ability that awaited them in the kingdom. They didn't emphasize the sonship aspect. They emphasized the human aspect. Oh, we, you, you see it consistently. Paul, when he goes to uh, Jerusalem, what does he have to know? These are, the, these are the chosen. These are the individuals who, the movers and shakers. The first thing he has to deal with is Jewish tradition. They want him to get circumcised. They want uh, uh, Titus to get circumcised. He got, he got fed up with that stuff. He said, you know, the only reason I'm here is because the Lord told me to come. But I have to deal with this. I'm out of here. He got tired of that stuff because he was focusing on the prototokus aspect. This was a consistent problem. They could not get off the earth. Jesus was telling them even before he ascended, take this gospel and give it to everybody. It is universal. <clears throat> The calling is no longer limited to Israel from an Israelite perspective. You teach this gospel the way I taught you. They couldn't get off of it. They couldn't get to that, that degree. It's just lost. 
They were good men. They were committed. They were prototokes. But they captive to the earth component and uh, <clears throat> couldn't go beyond it. Paul, on the other hand, once he shook the dust off, he kept on going and never looked back. Now, the scripture teaches Bonatokas' sons, they will be given an account of their past and their future. Paul initially steps in and when he speaks, he speaks to the mature in that body. He's not speaking to the body in general. He says, I'm talking to the mature. What does he mean by the mature? Prototokos. Romans 8, 28 to 30. That was the full comprehension of his ministry to take the gospel to any prototokos that might be in the company of the church community. Romans 8, 29-30 For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate, conform to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. <coughs> Why is he saying this? He's limiting the message for whom he did foreknow to a select group. People take this, the average Christian takes this, and identify with it. He's not speaking to the average Christian. He's speaking to the prototokens about a select group, whom he did foreknow. To show the ignorance factor of this, you take somebody like Calvin, who went through these scriptures, and he comes up with his doctrines of uh, salvation, uh, a unique group, totally, totally wipes out the concept of what's being said here. He, he um, limits it to humans who God looked at from eternity and determined they were going to be saved no matter what they did, right. where they went, or who they were. This is a select group. Uh, uh, once saved, always saved. These are my sons. Mm. Instead of understanding when it says whom he did foreknow, he predetermined he had a relationship with them in eternity. That nothing to do with the human race that would come into being whatever time it was that they were going to come into being. The Lord was dealing with people right then and there. But the human race <coughs> can't comprehend it from that perspective. He goes on. Ephesians, the second chapter, 5 to 7. Here, he just comes right out and identifies with it. Not they, but we. Why? Because the Ephesians church is a prototypical church. Amen. Roman church, you had some prototokes in it, but the majority were temporal called. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us. Hath quickened us. He's talking about things that happen in eternity. Together with Christ, by grace you are saved, then hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. So Paul is consistent throughout his gospel. It's aimed at prototokos. People don't have the comprehension of what it is. They misconstrue what's being said. And uh, <clears throat> when this farce falls and collapses of its own weight, then the time is going to come when you you are going to step out and you're going to have been prepared 
to teach the prototypes. The father is going to release the bondage and the shackles of what's been blinding them, but they aren't going to have a clue as to what's happening. You're going to be responsible for enlightening them just as Paul was responsible for enlightening his brethren in his time, opening their eyes, putting them on the path in which they need to walk to receive what they need to attain to so that they can progress to what they have been called to in eternity. Turn back now with our close of Revelation 9 chapter, <coughs> a fifth chapter. Revelation 5. Revelation 5. Verse 10. <clears throat> and has made us unto our God, the Father, kings and priests. How did they know that? How did they know that? They've been taught. Oh. They've been taught. Yes, they're religious. Kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. The word on the earth comes from a Greek term, epi, it means over. We shall reign over the earth. <coughs> they understand totally who they are, what their destiny is, what their brother's destiny is, because they have received the fullness of the gospel. The whole counsel of God. And that's enabled them to stand, actually to sit in the presence of the Lord and give Him glory. And did, did they sing their testimonies? A new song. Why is it new? Because it's never been sung before. There's never been another group to sing it. But them, they're singing their experiences that they experienced on the earth and the result of what they have been given <coughs> to understand and to achieve. And you have two groups of testimonies in heaven. Mm -hmm. Some that are spoken, some that are sung. Why are they singing? Because of the delight that they have in expressing what they're expressing. They are in a state of euphoria because They've reached the total comprehension of why, who they are, what they are, and what their destiny is. Yes? So, they are very well aware of the inheritance and that they are in the kingdom of light. Yes. Okay. Yes. They've reached the fullness of what they've been called. They have experienced the glorification. Their seated in the thrones of Ephesians, the third chapter, which, uh, which talk about has risen us around Christ, so the throne is assigned to each individual. Now they and their counterpart merge permanently in that seat, that, seat, that throne. And now they're going to experience events that are opening up on the earth that they will ultimately be involved 